tell. This is the um, disability panel. My name is Cheryl Barrett. I'm the co-chair of the Disability Network. Uh, my fellow co-chair is Ben Cooper. I'd like to give a shout out to Carolyn Welsh, who was our original chair interim while we put this all together. We love you, we miss you, and we hope to see you soon. I've got to say hello as well to Val, who was, was nodding, who was all a fellow member. So there's two of us um, here today. Um, we've got an excellent panel, what can I say? We've got Vicky Foxcroft MP, we've got Valerie, we've got Fazilet Hadi, and we've got Councillor Eleanor Southwood. I'm not going to say too much about them because you've got the information and I know that they can speak for themselves. Our first speaker is Vicky. Great. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, um, inviting me and I'm absolutely um, delighted to be joining you um, today. Um, my name is Vicky Foxcroft, I'm the MP for Lewis from Deptford, but I'm also Shadow Minister for Disabled People. And so I just wanted to touch on um, a few areas. So sadly, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis has been stark. Um, it's really brought to the forefront the gaping inequality that exists in our society. Tragically, recent Office of National Statistics data showed that disabled people and those with health conditions which limit their daily activities have been disproportionately hit by COVID-19. Um, and with this group accounting for 59% of all deaths between March and July. And the worrying truth is that so many of these deaths were you know, potentially preventable. Now, right from the start of this pandemic, disabled people have been an afterthought. We've had poor accessibility of communication from government and many have been struggling to access food, medicines and PPE equipment. And when support was most needed across the country, countless people have been abandoned during this pandemic. And the Care Act easements enacted by this government have been one of the most overt affronts on disabled people's rights. In August, MENCAP found that during the lockdown, 69% of people with a learning disability had their social care cut or reduced. And is it any wonder that throughout the pandemic, research has consistently shown that disabled people are, are afraid and they feel like an afterthought. And in, in April, and I know you've got um, Disability Rights UK on, um, but, but them and Liberty wrote to eight local authorities that had already triggered the easement, warning them not to leave people without essential care. But they were not the only councils to do this. There were soon reports from across the country of people seeing their care cut or struggling to have their needs met despite that the fact that they lived in areas where the local authority hadn't used the easements at all. Now, I've heard stories from people who have gone months without a shower, who've been unable to take themselves to the loo, or who have spent lockdown lifting off packets of crisps because they could not cook a hot meal. Of course, our social care system was on its knees before the pandemic hit. Almost 8 billion had been cut from the adult social care budget since 2010. And this made it hard for people to get the help they needed before we entered a crisis and virtually impossible during one. And the sad result of losing the election by the numbers that we did is that we're limited in how much we can stop the government. When the easements were first tabled, I'm proud to say that Labour Party opposed it. But we now need to redouble our efforts to have these easements removed. Another area of the impact that has been wildly felt is among the clinically extremely vulnerable. This group of people, myself included, ending up shielding for over 12 weeks. I think it was like 18 in the end. And many of the 2.2 million people who were advised to shield 
will also define themselves as disabled. Now, time after time, disabled people and those children watched on as the government announced sweeping changes without a second thought for us. And when the national programme of shielding ended, it was done without consulting disabled people's organisations, many of whom warned that it was putting disabled people in danger. And with the new three-tier system now in place, the government urgently needs to think again about support offered for those who have been shielding. And another area I continue to remain concerned about is potential job losses disproportionately impacting on disabled people. A recent report by Citizens Advice titled An Unequal Crisis makes for alarming reading. Their report found that 27% of disabled people are facing redundancy. And that rises to 37% for those people whose disability has a substantial impact on their activities. And they also found that 48% of people who are extremely clinical, clinically vulnerable to coronavirus are facing redundancy. Now, as we come to the end of the furlough scheme, the potential for this to gap to widen should worry us all. The disability employment gap has been an issue for too long. Now is the time for bold ideas and interventions to ensure disabled people do not bear the brunt of this crisis. And the final area I wanted to focus on is funding for local government and that impact on disabled people. If this government is going to support disabled people and households proper, properly, it really does need to follow through on its commitment to local government. It's these authorities that deliver so many frontline services. Take, for example, my own local authority, Lewisham. They've done a fantastic job in hard times, supporting disabled and shielded people throughout this crisis. And they were told by government, they would receive whatever is necessary. However, of the 60 million they've additionally spent, the government have only given them 20 million. That's a 40 million pound shortfall. And this just can't be right. The new government line is that they need to share the burden. But have they forgotten councils are already struggling after a decade of austerity imposed by them? Now, I really look forward to working you know, with all of you to make sure that we really do think about our policies and our priorities in the future and that we have some really decent discussions on this, but thank you. Thank you. And we're really, really so glad that we've got you, Vicky, in the um, spirit of nothing about us without us. You really are one of us. I'd like to now introduce Valerie bossman Kershey. She's also one of us. She's part of the Disability Network, a newly elected member of the committee, and I'm sure she'll introduce herself further. Thank you, Chair Cheryl. Thank you. And um, a lovely good afternoon to all of um, fellow cooperators and those listening in on the live stream. Um, I've been introduced. Um, so my name is Valerie Bosman Kwashi. I'm a community campaigner a political activist and in my own capacity I'd just like to share a few facts and just you know thoughts about how I feel about being a part of this amazing platform the disability awareness and um, with the cooperative so firstly it's important to mention to all of you the disability month is taking place um, from November the 18th to December the 18th um, making the United Nations um, International Day of um, persons with disability awareness December the 3rd. Um, I mentioned this only because we've just in um, you know Black History Month and disability awareness these two marginalized groups it's really important that we champion all that is within those two groups especially and we highlight the inequalities that many disabled people experience um, at the hands of the draconian uh, policies this this conservative government is putting in place. Um, it's really important um, that um, I share my personal feelings and I think many um, disabled um, people that are suffering out there would agree with me that we are always an afterthought when it comes to, you know, especially the pandemic at the moment and putting in certain safety net measures to support us and the security is very weak. 
Um, I felt during the lockdown, um, I was on the ground um, helping the community that we didn't often think about um, those that had disability um, um, issues. Um, not my local council, my borough Islington is amazing, championing all those with marginalisation um, issues. Um, but for me, um, things like food justice and, and climate justice and human rights and all the acts that we think about, including data protection laws and equality, um, these did not come into the forefront when the um, COVID-19 hit our communities. Um, I really welcome Vicky Foxtrot. Um, she's amazing um, as an MP and championing her um, collective team effort on the action points that, that she challenged the government in terms of COVID responses and making sure that the policies um, are adhered to. The Running Me Trust, um, their report um, on the 15th of August, 2020, this year, of course, um, um, report stated that black minority ethnic groups and people with disabilities are overexposed and under um, represented when it comes to looking at policies and protective measures. When we look at things like mental health disparities and overcrowded which um, housing, which um, Vicky just mentioned, and living spaces at home, and the constant mess of the education system, we can see that children that suffer the most and young people with disabilities um, are always the last thought as well. And we need our schools to be properly funded. Being a fellow um, cooperator means so much to me. And I just wanna say a massive thank you to all of you that voted for me and gave me the opportunity to be that representative and be that voice to champion all of us. Um, just a, a thought, a final thought, if I may add, um, I just feel that, you know, in light of um, with our new um, crisis and it's still looming and the Brexit conundrum, I really think under the leadership um, of Keir Starmer and with our fellow cooperators as sister party and our 2017 amazing manifesto and the 2019 parts of where it mentioned about having better representation of disability people um, at the forefront in policy making, I think we're doing an amazing job in fighting for justice, um, equality and fairness. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And it's great to be on a, a committee and be able to serve with you. And I'm sure that Vicky's going to be um, quite a regular with us as we all work together. I'd uh, like to introduce Fazla Hardy now. Basler is the head, um, interim head of the policy and research for Disability Rights UK. I'm sure she'll be able to say more about herself and what she does. Um, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, as you said, I'm Fazile Harvey and I work for Disability Rights UK, which is an organisation led by disabled people fighting for equality for disabled people. Um, I want to, I, 2020 uh, is a pivotal moment for disabled people. It really feels like a watershed moment. So I want to say a bit about looking back at the last 25 years since the Disability Discrimination Act, a little bit about um, the last six months, which uh, Vicky has spoken powerfully about, and a few words about the future. It just feels like we're on this kind of um, crest at the moment, looking backwards and looking forwards. So a few reflections first about um, the last 25 years. You know, I really honour the disability campaigners that fought for the Disability Discrimination Act. Uh, we eventually got an act protecting our rights nearly two decades after the acts for race and sex discrimination were passed. So long, long overdue. And though that um, act, which has now been incorporated into the Equality Act is amazing. It at last recognizes that we experience direct and indirect discrimination. It says that um, policies and practices should be developed with us in mind. It says that we should have reasonable adjustments and it puts special duties on public authorities to put us and other protected characteristics at the heart of their planning and service delivery. Unfortunately, the act is quite difficult for us as individuals to enforce. 
um, the processes are cumbersome. We, we don't have the money. We're not given the financial support to, to enforce the act. And actually public authorities haven't really taken um, inclusion to their heart in the way they plan the highways, the services, the transport, any of it. So it's an amazing step forward, but um, my reflection is that it has a lot of things that need strengthening. My second reflection is around public services and Vicky touched on this. So we've seen just the the most amazing slashing of public services. And these services really affect us as disabled people. Uh, we've seen many fewer people getting care and support and those getting it getting less than they need to live full and active lives. Uh, we've seen children with special education needs and disability not getting the support they need to flourish and their families being poorly supported. We've seen employment programmes that were targeted at disabled people being slashed. So it's been, we might have got some rights, but we've had services taken away. The third reflection is a bit more positive. Um, for some disabled people, for many maybe, um, digital inclusion um, has been amazing. And I do accept that it's not for all disabled people and I would never uh, want to see digital as the only solution. But for a lot of disabled people, it has allowed us to be connected, to communicate, to shop, to get information, to get peer support in ways that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. So coming on to my realizations from the last six months, which have been um, an incredibly distressing time for disabled people. 60% of deaths have been of disabled people and we've taken the brunt of a lot of the, um, the measures. And my first reflection is that our lives aren't valued equally. And we saw at the beginning of um, the pandemic at the end of March, um, things like the, the frailty scale, which said if you needed more support, you probably needed less intervention medically and you would be less prioritized. And whilst NHS very quickly moved to say that wasn't true, I think that left a bad taste. We also saw the do not resuscitate notices being sent in a blanket way to people in care homes and residential settings. And the CQC is now investigating that, but that left a very, very bad taste about the worth of our lives. We saw government delays in implementing social care plans, getting PPE to those who needed it and testing. And we actually saw them taking rights away in the Coronavirus Act. I find that all quite shocking. And we saw major businesses, multi-million pound businesses like supermarkets, unable to provide reasonable adjustments for hundreds of thousands of disabled people who wanted to shop online or in store really incredible at a time when they were making ginormous profits. So these things have really put a spotlight on inequality. So moving to how we renew our society, I think there's some big questions for people who care about disability equality. How do we make our voice stronger? How do we bring people with us? How do we get more allies? How do we get people to understand that we're not being treated as equal citizens, but maybe say it in a way that people get rather than sounding like a minority group on a hobby horse. It's really difficult and I'd welcome um, any thoughts people have got on that. How do we influence the planning um, around employment, around um, social care, so that we learn from the last six months and we don't see disabled people further e excluded? How do, we, how do we get government to listen to us and engage with us? Because their record so far on actually engaging with disabled people isn't great. And finally, how do we actually make sure that the disability strategy that government is gonna publish next spring is a strategy that's ambitious for inclusion and not just a strategy that tinkers and makes some incremental change. 
Thank you. Thank you. That was really wonderful. And hopefully a lot of people out there are starting to get really interested and you're starting to think about your questions, your comments. And while you're doing that, I'd like to introduce you to councillor Eleanor Southwood. She's a Labour councillor in Brent. She's the lead for housing and welfare reform. And she's also the chair for the RNIB with a particular interest in partner organisations, how together we tackle employment opportunities and representation in civic and public life. So I've said a fair bit about you there, Eleanor, but feel free to say anything else you like. And uh, really looking forward to hearing what you have got to contribute today. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction. And it's absolutely brilliant to be here and part of this panel. And I have the unenviable task, of course, of, of being the final one to speak. And after such fantastic contributions, this comes with a, a fair sense of um, of nervousness on my part. But um, yeah, so I, um, I'm i cabinet member for housing and welfare reform in Brent, um, which of those, for those of you who don't know, London is Northwest London, so it includes Wembley and so on. So um, alongside that, I am chair of the Royal National Institute of Blind People, RNIV. And so I come at this, I, I guess, with a sort of, um, with those two interests. So when I was thinking about and reflecting on comments for today, um, I came up with a sort of um, combination, I suppose, of what I've observed and experienced over the past six months in particular in both of those roles. Um, and I, I, I hope that will be sort of helpful. And actually some of those reflections do speak to what other panelists have raised. So it's great to get the discussion going already. First thing to say is um, that Vicky's comments on the financial state for local government really resonate with me. So our figures in Brent are quite similar to those in Lewisham. Um, we were told at the outset, do what you must do. Um, it's important, you will be compensated. And I guess for me in particular, that was about housing all of our rough sleepers. Then the communication started to talk about sharing the burden, which was a, a very different kind of message. And, and that went for homelessness, but it went for everything right across the board. Um, I wanted to think about uh, what's been happening to us over the past six months in, in terms of, um, I suppose, accessibility, really. So I, I've been thinking about in accessible information, accessible support during lockdown and, and the first wave, how accessible the recovery has been. Um, but also the accessibility of, of the future. And Fazile's questions have really got me thinking on that. So I'll probably go far off what I was intending to say. Information first then. So we really were, I think, quite shocked at RNIB and also through, through the council at, at just how inaccessible basic information was to people with disabilities. So we had um, official government tweets that were not accessible, that were just pictures, which we had to robustly challenge on a number of occasions. We had um, very difficult information to understand. Um, for you know, some of our residents in Brent, it was not in an appropriate format at all. Then we had the changing nature of the information. So um, lots of our residents with learning disabilities fed back that, that it was just appalling because no sooner had you figured out what might happen and, and therefore what you might be able to um, do or not do, and then it changed the next day. And I think that has caused a huge amount of anxiety. Um, and then, you know, there's the whole thing about just uh, digital, uh, basically. So uh, we held a digital disability forum in June through the council. and. Um, on the, on the one hand, it's incredibly positive because lots of people were involved and took part who actually didn't often do that and, and weren't normally able to participate necessarily when it involves traveling about and, and so on. And actually, we have had feedback from some of our sort of local forums and organizations that the um, inclusion of and participation by disabled residents has really increased. So I think that is something to, to hold on to. However, those people without digital access and who are digitally excluded, I think have been entirely left out. And that has become very apparent to the point where we've actually put together a digital support package through Brent for residents because it is not a nice to have, it is a fundamental right now. 
the support, how accessible was that? So starting with the council, I guess um, education was, was a key one, um, thinking about uh, children with disabilities. And one of our schools, um, I think were really quick off the mark, we thought really creatively about that and actually did do some home visits to make sure that our young people weren't missing out. We had people who were unable to access basic food, medicine, as has been mentioned earlier. And I think many people hadn't realised that disabled people often don't shop online as an option and because it's easier. It's because it's essential and really the only way um, to get what you want and what you need and be able to have any genuine choice. Um, but the support around um, company and isolation is the one that I think has you know, I suppose personally stayed, stayed with me most. We know that isolation amongst disabled people is, is really high. And I think it, it's been just heartbreaking. The number of people who we spoke to through RNIB, we called all of our customers as a, as a kind of um, well-being check call. Number of people for whom we were the only call that week was shocking. And ditto through the council, just the amount of loneliness and isolation that that people were experiencing <laughs> so people started to cheer up in early june july didn't they when it was thought we could all get out and about and actually some of the aspects of coming out of lockdown particularly for blind and partially sighted people um including myself actually so i'm totally blind as well it was really anxiety provoking because um lots of physical changes were happening to the streets around us um and for obvious reasons, there wasn't the usual um, opportunities for uh, consultation. So that was a bit scary. Places that you got to know were no longer the same. Social distancing measures in shops aren't always accessible. So often they are, um, you know, they rely on kind of signage or tape on the floor to show you where to go. Um, and the uh, sort of uh, perspex shields in shops, uh, which, you know, a number of people I've spoken to have sort of walked into and bumped into and you know, it doesn't exactly add to the dignity of the experience. And social distancing in general. So of course, if you can't see, it's really hard to social distance. And I'm afraid that a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of our customers, a lot of blind and partially sighted people have been kind of yelled at and verbally abused um, by members of the public. So it's a really serious issue. We finally got some guidance essentially from government to say that it's okay to be guided and the, to suggest safe ways for doing it. But that took months. Ditto priority arrangements with supermarkets took months. It was all far too slow. For the future, um, the economy, I think, is where my mind goes to. Um, lots of disabled people, I think, have really valued the opportunity to work virtually over the past few months um, and to feel fully included. You're not at, you know, the, the field is a level one um, when you turn up to a meeting. Certainly, that's a personal reflection I had. I, I realised how much energy it took just to get somewhere and work out where you were, never mind the content of the meeting. So I think that has been really positive. But who is at the bottom of the pile in economic downturn? It is always disabled people. And I think there is no, you know, there's no particular uh, grounds for optimism that that won't be the case. We know if you are totally blind, only one in 10 people is likely to be in employment at all. So I think that's a really serious thing for us to think about. And to end, just on Fazile's question, really, um, which really got me thinking, which is how, how do we do this? And one positive thing that, that I've observed and, and feedback both through sort of council and RNIB is that I think lots of people who don't have lived experience of disability have felt in different ways disabled by circumstances around them. And I don't think that's something people forget easily. I don't think that the fear and frustration of not being able to do what you want um, is, you know, is easily forgettable. So I do have cautious optimism that there is a, a, a sort of sense out, out there, a, a sort of sense, if not of appreciation and understanding, but at least of recognition that actually disability is something that can impact on us all and doesn't always come in obvious shapes and sizes. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, we've got our first question. It's from Mark Bryant. And the question is, how can we prevent the same number of deaths of disabled people and those with mental health conditions occurring again, as in the first wave? And a related question from Duncan McGibbon, 
about the parliamentary report that recorded early mortality with regards to learning disability and should we reinstate that? Who would like to go first? Um, I think maybe Vicky. Um, yeah, ab absolutely, really good and important questions. Um, I think that in terms of government, you know, we, we keep saying, you know, you need to urgently learn the lessons. So if we take, um, you know, the deaths of people with learning disabilities and their um, slow response to that, yet their speedy response in terms of needing an urgent review um, when um, testing arrangements weren't as um, the health secretary saw them. So I think making sure that we have urgent reviews and that we learn um, lessons you know, uh, one of the things is access to PPE. Everybody needs to gain, uh, you know, access to PPE. People, um, you know, social care workers, as well as disabled people, um, as well as making sure that people have got access to, um, you know, tests. You know, we're supposed to have, and we've heard it so many times, you know, this world BT and test track and trace system in place. Um, and we've seen a lot of errors, you know, from government on this. I think the one thing that kind of, if I was just touching on the Labour Party that I think is absolutely right, is we're not actually looking to political point score during, during this. We really desperately want the government to get it right. You know, when we're having to call for certain things, so the sage advice that went and said we should be having a two or three week circuit break, we're not saying that because we think that it'll be popular. We're saying that because, you know, the scientists of which that is when we've been back in the government on things are saying we need we need to do this to make sure that we save lives. So I think that, you know, we in the Labour Party have an obligation to put pressure on the government to make sure that they are, you know, following the science on stuff, you know, and if you take, for example, another thing, you know, the pubs and the 10 p.m. curfew, is that following the science? You know, Keir's got an asked on several occasions, you know, can you provide us with this? Um, and I think that that's really important. You know, at the start of this pandemic, this was a new disease to us all and we knew um, very little about it. And now we're learning a lot more um, about it. And we really do need to, to make sure that we put those measures in place. So just kind of quickly recapping, you know, the access to the PPE, the access to the testing. And if the scientists are saying that we need, you know, our circuit break, then we need to be listening to what the scientists are saying. Okay, uh, Basile, would would you like to contribute to this question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I must admit, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that the government is taking a fresh approach to um, protecting, um, supporting disabled people. Um, so I. I was a bit underwhelmed by the guidance on shielding that came out yesterday. I kind of feel it basically said, you know, be sensible. And if you're in danger, we, you'll get a letter at some point. And if you have that letter from us notifying you that you need to shield, then you will get a, a basic level of income protection and you shouldn't go to work. Well, I, I really don't think that's good enough. Um, I don't think the social care winter plan um, went far enough. Um, it didn't. Um, we're still talking about whether people can visit care homes rather than family members being given special status for testing. We're still talking about pilots. Even today in the news, it said that the government um, is now consulting on care homes uh, to find care homes that are happy to take uh, people with positive coronavirus um, tests. So I, I kind of feel. Where's the um, creativity? Where's the funding that went into building the Nightingale hospitals or, or shaping the job support scheme? Where, where is that creativity in relation to supporting disabled people and people with long-term health conditions? I just don't see it. Okay. Eleanor, do you have any comments? I was just thinking about information really because I, I think part of what increases people's vulnerability is not being able to access the basic information about 
you know, what, what symptoms to watch out for, what to do if you're unsure, even down to, you know, what's the number to ring if you're, you know, if you don't know, we need advice. So I think it has to start there. And I think one of the things that, that strikes me from the government's approach is it, it is an approach which does kind of risk infantilizing people a bit as well. So, you know, it's up to the government to tell you if you should shield and, and so on. And I just don't think that can be right. But people can only make meaningful choices if, if they can actually access the basic information. So, um, yeah, the Zile's right. If the same kind of uh, enthusiasm and, and, you know, keenness was put into um, solving this problem as some of the early problems, what was that awful phrase the government were using? Gamifying things. You know, I think um, Dominic Cummings and his, his, you know, his friends like to like see it as a, as a game to some extent. Um, so we need a bit of that energy focused our way. Valerie? Yeah, I, I don't really want to repeat what everyone has said, but I just think it's that kind of tiered, um, kind of triangular approach. So local people, local government connected, the multi-agencies, and um, just giving local government the, 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 the money and the information that they need. I know we're leaving the EU, you know, and certain policies, you know, I think of the Data Protection Act, and how, you know, when the mutual aid group came together, how, how it was so vital that we had certain people on the ground that knew the local people, um, you know, in the local estates, whether they were residents, so we could actually get that support to them. You know, the first week of the lockdown, the government was too slow to act. They sent, you know, loads of food that was, you know, inadequate. Um, you wouldn't even feed that to your dog, um, literally. And I just think, just like everyone has said, I just think, Disabled people for, for far too long have been the last, you know, the last people in anything. And, you know, as a black woman speaking to you with hidden disabilities, I can't stress to you how much, you know, pain and anguish, like I know many, you know, comrades go through, you know, every single day. And it's equally hard when you're a woman and when you're a young person, you know, just one last point, the education, you know, we still haven't seen this catch up scheme. It's not going to be, you know, rolled out in terms of, those that are, you know, children with disabilities that, and, you know, adult care, carers that want to learn, you know, just stuff like that. And I think, I don't know what we're going to do, but I just think we need more funding. And I just, I want local government to have more authority to do what they can do on the ground because they're, they're more, you know, able than the national government. That's the truth that I feel. Thanks. Thank you. I've got another question. This is from Carla. Carla's concerned that COVID will create even more of a two-tiered workforce with people who are more vulnerable and with disabilities unable to access many jobs because we still want to stay home to stay safe. What measures would help ensure we can access all job opportunities equally and safely? And I think probably Fuzzily is chomping at the bit to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a really tough question, isn't it? So I think someone mentioned earlier that um, for some disabled people, um, working from home has been amazing. And they've almost sort of said, do you know what? You could have let us do this as a reasonable adjustment years ago. Um, for, for others, um, they aren't in jobs. You know, a lot of us as disabled people aren't necessarily in sectors where you can work from home. A lot of us are in more frontline jobs. We might be in retail or hospitality or leisure. And it's really challenging. Um, and the government, of course, uh, has put some obligations on employers to make their workplaces COVID safe. But um, for some people, that won't be safe enough. So I think it's a real challenge. I mean, the government's come up with two schemes already, one for disabled, uh, one for, sorry, for young people and we're concerned that the criteria don't make it easy for disabled young people to join in that scheme. And um, there, we don't think there's a specialist support in job centers where they really understand disability or careers advice. And we think access to work is a bit too slow. Um, they have recently announced last week a scheme for um, everyone. Um, and again, um, you don't benefit from that scheme um, if you're on certain um, benefits, uh, you've got a limited capability for work. So we're not seeing any evidence that they're really putting their mind to thinking, okay, disabled people 
are going to be disproportionately negatively affected by the recession caused by the virus. How do we support disabled people to stay in work and to get work? And again, we see no creativity going into that, into that um, endeavor. We just see schemes coming out which don't really consider the, the barriers that disabled people face in the workplace and the additional support we need. Thank you. Vicky? Sorry, my delay is just whilst I'm unmuting. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, um, you know, a really um, concerning thing. And I think that in terms of, um, you know, the disability employment gap, like I was reading something, I think, yesterday, um, in terms of where actually, the reason why it decreased was actually because of um, figures and kind of playing about in terms of different things. Um, and I think that it does need to be at the heart in terms of the recovery. And exactly what Fazli was saying is what I've heard. Some people have, have loved it and the adjustments that have been able to take place that, you know, if coronavirus hadn't happened, you know, the employers never would have looked to do. And other people um, haven't, you know, but, but other things that we've seen some rapid changes to are um, in terms of access to work where they said they couldn't make changes in terms of different forms for being able to apply for it. And then there are online versions of being able to apply at times. Um, and, you know, we need to make that better and government need to, um, you know, kind of really look at that. And if I just kind of just share one thing in terms of myself, and this is kind of how I feel in terms of the government doing stuff. So. When this all first happened, Parliament had remote voting, uh, we had remote participation, not just in questions and statements like we do now, but actually in bill committees. And I um, contributed to the domestic abuse bill and I thought it worked perfectly fine. Obviously not as you know perfect as before, but it worked and I was able to contribute. And then they got rid of it all. And I think they got rid of it all because actually it worked too well. Um, and I think if you, you know, was really to get the truth of where Jacob rees mogg was on there. So then you went out in Parliament with a kind of two tier of politicians as well. You know, those that, that can go and contribute to everything and then those that can't. You know, and before this crisis, I wouldn't have told anybody necessarily about my rheumatoid arthritis and the medication I'm on. But I felt like I had to, to explain why I wasn't going into Parliament. And so, you know, if in terms of the way in the system that our Parliament works, sends out that kind of message, you know, how, how do we go in and about showing different kind of messages? And that's not a positive thing that I'm actually saying, it's a really negative thing. Um, but I think that's, you know, the role of all disabled people uh, disabled people organisations and so forth to really kind of pop that pressure on government. And I know it's hard when you fight it in terms of, you know, pip appeals and so forth, but stuff like this and when we, you know, gather together to, to really kind of hammer, you know, home some of that stuff is really important. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to bring in another question now. It's from Joe Watkinson. The Disability Network is a great starting point to improve representation of the disabled within the party, how do we improve representation of disabled people throughout our party and wider society? And related to that from Sue Milestone is, what can be done to encourage, mentor and support people with disabilities to stand as candidates and to get elected into office? And I'm going to go to Eleanor first and then to Valerie for this. Great, thank you. Um, fantastic question and one which, again, I think we have seen um, snail-like progress on in recent years. So um, there's quite a lot of rhetoric around this. Um, all parties seem to want it. Um, and yet there are still some really basic barriers. So um, one of them we talked a little bit about, actually, which is kind of ways of working and, and restrictions for some people that are created by the way in which you're expected to do a particular job. Um, and that goes for kind of local voluntary and, you know, part of 
being in a, any political party is your local activism and so on. And there's some very traditional views around about what that is. So if you can't physically deliver leaflets or you don't physically go on doorsteps, you call or you do other things. I think there's still a long way to go in understanding of that. Um, basic application processes are still not accessible. So for example, uh, I am unable to complete the uh, Labour Party's form for standing to be a parliamentary candidate uh, because it is, um, you know, all boxes and macros and, and you know, so in every step you get, um, you, you do get um, barriers. But the biggest barrier, as with all these things, is understanding and, it, and it's people. And I'm afraid oftentimes party memberships are, how can I say this politely, so, that, so they're not necessarily representative of communities in the sense that you know, lots of people don't join things anymore. So party membership tend to represent a more traditional viewpoint. And I think that creates a real challenge for want to be, you know, disabled councillors and, um, and parliamentarians and so on. I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah, there's a whole host of things. Valerie. Yeah, um, thank you. It's a really important question. Um, I, I just say the same thing again, really. It's just about I'm um, speaking to the people that are actually experiencing it. I think often we see, you know, no fault of anyone, but we just don't have representation and diversity and equality and fairness. We speak on these things all the time, but actually, do we actually know what it means? I don't, I don't know. Just looking at, you know, the, the model of Maslow's theory and, you know, all of our, you know, needs as, as a child, you wouldn't treat a child a certain way. So I don't see why when you're going through life and become an adult, you're kind of left, you know, just to kind of fend for yourself. And I just think we need to look at all the protective characteristics of individuals and speak truth to power and really support them. So when we look at access to like campaigning, I mean, we've seen since COVID-19, you know, we're all on Zoom now and, you know, the digital world has exploded. I know, I know we're not all on Zoom, but for years, you know, the Labour Party, the Cooperative Party, we could have been doing so many things, you know, on webinars, etc. You know, we've got the big corporate businesses doing these, you know, seminars, etc. online. Why can't we have the same thing? So it just comes back down to class again. So I just think we need to all be equal. And when we look at things, look at the dynamism that everyone has and shares and actually start to differentiate a little bit more and be a little bit more innovative. Um, just to mention one last point on the last question about the workforce, and I, I think it's a really important point that the you know the companies, the supermarkets made a, a bucket load of money. They are now they are now charging twenty pence um, for plastic bags. You know we have another pan pandemic in terms of plastic waste, and many people with disabilities. You know it's so difficult to get out to the shops and to even carry certain bags. We need more you know kind of trolley access, etc. I just think. We need to just look at everything and just kind of start from the bottom up and just rebuild. And I think the, the, the conference is talking about, you know, take back control in the future and, you know, rebuild. And I think it's just so pertinent now. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Could I just say that to have only five MPs declaring a disability out of 650 is utterly, utterly shameful. And um, the gov at the moment, there isn't even a fund in place to support the reasonable adjustments that disabled people might need in terms of campaigning for public office. So uh, it's a dire, dire situation which needs to be put right. Absolutely. The next question is from Jane Cameron. Long COVID, will any research be done into whether disabled or vulnerable people have been disproportionately affected? And I'd like to uh, use the chair's um, privilege here and say, I'm particularly interested in what's happened with medically unexplained and undiagnosed people who will now be falling, I think, into the same category as people with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome and just not having proper diagnosis, proper care and access to benefits. So with that little caveat, I'll throw it in there. Um, maybe again, I'll go first um, to Vicky in terms of, is there anything, you know, in Parliament or, you know, any buzz around there that anything might be commissioned? I mean, this is one of the things that we're trying to put pressure on government to make sure that they 
um, you know, do review stuff and do make sure that we learn lessons. You know, we don't know how long we're going to be stuck, um, you know, with coronavirus um, and also understanding, you know, some of the kind of effects in terms of long COVID. But kind of what I said in my introductory remarks as well, you know, we're not the government. So I wish I could answer it and say, we're doing this. And I wish you could come back to me and say, well, why are you not doing this extra? And I could go, oh, right. Okay, well, we'll go and think of that. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're there and we can, you know, kind of question and quiz government to make sure they're doing more, but we're not, we're not in charge of what they um, do, but we will be putting pressure on them to do so. Well, we've got a final two questions and we're running out of time. Do you, do we want to quickly take them? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm just waiting for them to come into my trusty. <laughs> okay. So these are the two final questions. The focus is on retail. There's been a big uh, group of the forgotten disabled, those who weren't in the shielding category, but who prior to COVID relied on things like home delivery for groceries, not eligible for food parcels and unable to obtain online grocery slots. What do we think we could do about that? And from Robert, how can we ensure all shop workers are fully aware of the needs of those with hidden disabilities? And too often we're challenged about not wearing face covering, even with a, an exemption certificate uh, demanded. Um, could the co-op be doing anything to help us and could we help the co-op to um, improve this? I saw you nodding there, Valerie. Would you like to go for it? And then I'll bring in um, Fazale, because I could see you were interested too. So yeah. I, I just I just think it goes back to the mutual aid. You know, people on the ground, the community are the best people at the forefront to, to deliver on certain things. And I think often, I, and I totally get it, we have representatives that are there to do their job, etc. But sometimes on the ground, they don't often see what we see as a community campaigner and a political activist, you know, intertwined. I just think I, I've seen things that, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to share and be a part of these kind of steering groups, but often again, never at the table. And um, it just feels like um, we do need to do more surveys. I mean, not just reports, just for doing them, say, you know, polls, but we need to really look at representation. And I don't say that lightly because when we look at diversity, you know, what is true diversity in its form? And, and someone just mentioned about hidden disabilities. And I think often so many organizations don't look at this, even in workplaces, you know, whether you're partially sighted, do you need, you know, bigger print or do you need, you know, a bigger screen to like tap into things, you know, do you need a light to kind of signal to, to signal to you when you're at the till? Do you need, you know, um, a special timer or um, you know a, a brighter light Th these are the kind of things even crossing roads so I think a lot of investment needs to be done at the local level in the communities and we just need to be having our local um, you know councillors more on the ground as well to talk to us and they do a great job at the moment but I think there's still so much more they're missing out on and um, you know in the communities where it's at for me so yeah I hope that answers a little bit and solidarity thank you. That's like so on supermarkets, um, they are, I know they don't think they are, but they are covered by the Equality Act. And if you need a reasonable adjustment, which means if you need an online slot, if you need a chair to sit down on because you can't queue for long periods, um, if you need support in store, you should be getting these things. And um, a lot of people have actually gone to solicitors to challenge supermarkets, which is just incredibly ridiculous because they've got the money and they should make the adjustment. Um, in terms of face coverings, um, the government did do a good job in making clear that um, some disabled people um, with either physical or mental um, um, issues could have exemptions. What they did a terrible job in is communicating that to the general public. And actually, we now see a lot of problems with peer policing, um, with people being taught, you know, not believed when they say they've got uh, an impairment, things that should not be happening. And that is because when the government communicated the face coverings issue, they said, it's mandatory, it's 
you'll be criminalized, you'll be fined. They didn't say, do you know what, there are exemptions. And we do need, if we're gonna carry on wearing face coverings for the next year, we need the government to mount a proper communications campaign so the public, including retail staff, understand that it's perfectly legitimate for those disabled people that can't wear a face covering uh, for them not to wear one. Thank you. I'm going to have to wrap up now. And uh, it's been it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to listen to the excellent panelists that we've got. I hope you've all enjoyed it too. Um, thank you for the great questions. If you've just joined this session, uh, the call party is going to be back at six o'clock. And the discussion is going to be on the cooperative movement's role through a second wave. We'll have Paul Gerrard from the Co-op Group, Karen Craven from the Active Wellbeing Society, Joe White from Co-op Futures and Stella Creasy, uh, Co-op Labour MP and NEC member. Um, I'm really glad that I managed to stay upright all of this time. I've got pots and dysautonomia. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want to faint and bash my head on the desk on camera. <laughs>